The Blob, a novel by David Bischoff, based on a screenplay by Chuck Russell and Frank Darabont. The NASA space program has shown us, with its video coverage and its National Geographic type photos, just how beautiful the Earth is when viewed from outer space. The object, however, was blind and could not perceive this beauty. At 100 miles up, the gravity well of Earth is a powerful force and it already had the object in its grip. But the object, having no senses, did not perceive the rapid diminishing of its weightlessness. The object had had a long voyage, but it had no idea of time or even space. So even as the unseen physical force of gravity began relentlessly tugging it down towards the beginning of the Earth's atmosphere, there was no resistance. As the object touched the exosphere, a vast stretch of cerulean stitched with swaths of white, the Pacific Ocean with white clouds unfolded beneath it. The object noted neither the calm nor the beauty below. It simply did not care. As the object passed over a scatter of clouds amid this vast sea, the air molecules it struck began to create friction. One side of its casing began to glow, first a soft pink, then a bright cherry, then a vibrant red as ablation commenced. As it passed over the edge of a great dun and green colored continent, the object had no recognition that this was North America. Its descent from a wide trajectory had deepened rapidly, driving it at a great velocity beyond the deserts and mountains, the cities and smog of California. Into the stratosphere it blazed, its burning descent now giving not only light and heat, but sound as well. No one noticed this sound, however, least of all the object. By now the object was a full-fledged meteor, screaming relentlessly out of space, shrieking through the darkening skies above the western United States. Great mountains reared up below, vast deserts swept out into the realm of twilight. The cities of man, large and small, sparkled to life with electricity as night descended. As it entered the mesosphere, a blazing, brief new star in the firmament, the object could have seen its destination, if it had eyes. If it had a mind to know such things, it would have known that it would just land on the outskirts of a relatively secluded town in Colorado among the Rocky Mountains, a town called, plainly enough, Morgan City. As it dived down toward impact, the burning object trailed a long tail of light and heat. The object's exterior was burning away, but it felt nothing. Inside, however, something stirred. And this something did feel a sensation as the object hurtled from the sky toward the town of Morgan City, just past twilight on the typical quiet night. It felt a sensation very strong and insistent and demanding. It felt hunger. Bodies clashed beneath the sun of an unseasonably hot day in Morgan City. The air echoed with the sounds of grunts and groans. Muscles heaved. Sweat mixed with a dash of blood dripped onto the ground as 22 teenagers performed the ritual rumble of male aggression known as football. Paul watched from the bench as the Morgan High Hawks battled the Banning High Raccoons. I gotta get more into the game, thought Paul Tyler. Knowing that as a wide receiver he was a vital element of play, especially with the score tied at 14-14 to in the fourth quarter. I gotta get my spirit up, get the old team gonzo gutsiness singing in the veins. We gotta win this one, he thought to himself, trying to echo in his heart the wild cheers bellowing from the bleachers. We gotta slaughter those raccoons. We gotta go home wearing coon skin caps, damn it. The game was a grudge match. There was nothing that the goons on the Banning High School football squad wanted more than to humiliate the Morgan City High School football team. To chew off their noses and spit them into the dust. To stomp their bodies to bloody bits with their cleats. Paul Tyler knew this. He knew also the game was a playoff and that the winner of the match would go on to the county championships, something that had eluded Morgan City for more than a decade. But for the life of him, as he sat on that hard bench, draped in shoulder pads and football jersey, clutching his helmet like a talisman, all he could think about was one of the cheerleaders. 
And there she was, only ten feet away, a flash of red and blue and pink thigh. Her name was Meg Penny. And Paul had been watching her do this rah-rah routine all season. But still he couldn't get enough of it. Go, Hawks, go! Remember the Alamo! Try, Hawks, try! Make the raccoons cry! They chanted. Incredibly stupid, yes. But that m magnificent female body squeezed into that skimpy outfit was nothing to laugh at. Paul especially liked the way her long chestnut hair bounced over her shoulders and back, a curly fall of joy framing an incredibly cute face, and those beautiful deep brown eyes, and the bright pink of her cheeks, the white gleam of her teeth, the way her uniform would ride up over her rump when she performed her cheerleading contortions. And then, wonder of wonders, all of reality seemed to fade away from Paul Tyler. Meg Penny turned, and she smiled at him. Paul turned away, embarrassed that she had caught him staring. He didn't want her to think that the only thing he did was drool over her, the way she bounced around in her cheerleader's garb. Of course, he found her physically attractive, incredibly so, in fact, but he also liked a lot of things about Meg. He liked her spunky personality and her constant sunny optimism. His reverie was broken by a nudge from a teammate. I'm telling you, man, she wants your bodily fluids. Droplets of water splashed Paul's dirt-smudged face. Annoyed, he turned to the guy sitting next to him, who had just taken a squeeze bottle of water from an ice chest and was busily squirting the cooling stuff all over his grubby face. Scott Jeske had been ribbing Paul all month about his infatuations with Meg. Paul tried to ignore his friend's remarks as he turned his gaze back to the playing field where the Hawks' defensive team were lining up again. Scott and his one-track mind, however, just wouldn't let go. You gotta ask her out, he yelled. Can't you see that she's just begging for the kind of satisfaction only a lusty football stud can provide? Paul turned and glared at his friend. Scott was shorter than Paul by half a head, and sometimes he seemed dumber by ten times that amount. But what Scott Jeske lacked in height or intelligence, he more than made up for in sheer obnoxiousness. I told you, man, she's dating Pulver. Scott shook his blonde head and grinned. I got the official word, pal. That relationship's going nowhere. It's Zerosville. His small blue eyes darted furtively, quickly searching to make certain Pulver wasn't within earshot. Take a shot, for Christ's sakes. Paul took the water bottle from Scott and splashed his face. God, he knew he must smell like a zoo by now. Three and a half hard quarters of kissing dirt was no preparation for asking a stunner like Meg Penny out on a date. Goodness knew he had thought about it long enough. He even rehearsed a number of lines, consistently, mostly of clever quips and jaunty witticisms. He scrapped them, however, deciding it just made him sound as smart-alecky and horny as Scott. But as many times as he'd almost approached Meg, just as many times as he'd chicken out. Oh, sure, he talked to her. All the guys joked and partied with the cheerleaders to some extent. But he'd never even taken her aside for a one-on-one -on -one chat, much less asked her to a movie or a dance or even for a harmless ice cream soda. Again, Scott intruded on his reverie, his insinuating tone growing even more irritating. It grieves me to see you think so small, Scott whined. It really does, Paul. I I'm seeing an opportunity knocking, and you're just not answering. Give me a break, will you, Scott? I'll ask her out. I'll ask her out. The words were spontaneous, unplanned, but as soon as they dropped from his lips, he knew that he'd made a decision. Yes, by God, he would ask Meg Penny out. People said he was handsome, with his long face and his short nose, his straight, short brown hair and his green eyes. Paul didn't ask of himself in a way that he thought he was handsome, and he'd always felt awkward around girls. But maybe, just possibly, Meg wouldn't mind being around him for just a short date or something. This pronouncement of intention, however, wasn't enough to stifle an immediate gratification man like Scott Chesky. Bullshit! When? 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 He demanded to know. When the time is right, countered Paul. Timing is everything. Just then, Phil Owens, a defensive linebacker, intercepted a wobbly pass and made a quick dash of a whole nine yards before getting yanked down. 
Whoops and cheers erupted from the bleachers, and Meg Penny and company started their leaping and cavorting again. Coach Evans, constantly stalking the sidelines like a hungry tiger, stopped, watched his defensive boys pick themselves up and brush themselves off, then spun to his bench with an emphatic gesture. Okay, offensive line in! <laughs> yeah, sure, bozo, said Scott, tauntingly as he and Paul jogged out together for the huddle. When Ronald Reagan skis down old Windy naked, that's when you'll ask her out. You'll see, said Paul, pulling on his helmet and forming up with Ricky, teased the quarterback. You sure can pass a pass. Too bad you can't make one, Scott taunted. Hey, shut up, lardheads, said Tease. Listen up. The play was called. The lineup was formed. Every muscle in Paul's body seemed to ache as he looked over the scrimmage line into the scowling faces of the banning root raccoons. Somehow these clowns seemed lots bigger than the hawks, especially when you knew all they wanted was to dig a hole with your face guard and then stuff your body in it. Hup! cried the quarterback, grabbing the ball and then backpedaling. Paul, despite his misgivings and occasional lack of confidence, was a natural athlete. Responding to the call, he went into action, heading hard to one side towards the sidelines, fainting one way to fool his cover, and then charging at the breakneck speed to the targeted spot where he had a chance to be open to receive. The raccoon surged in towards the quarterback, who did a little skip, danced a little dance, then had about a third of a second to see if his boy was open. Paul ran along the white chalk line just where he was supposed to be. The quarterback's arm cocked back, sprang. The football sailed up into a sweet, perfect arc. Paul put on the necessary speed to be in the right place at the right time. And as the football sailed down toward him, he was aware of a mighty huffing and chuffing behind him. His cover. Well, better behind him than in front of him. He reached out, and almost as though by magic, the ball slapped down directly into his hands. He caught it. He pulled it into his chest, but in doing so, he had to slow down. By the time he was ready to pick up steam again, he realized he wasn't alone anymore. In fact, there were five guys zooming in on him, looking as if they were ready to kill. Paul tried to dodge, but it was too late. The surge hit him like an express train without brakes. He was flung to one side over the boundary mark and out of bounds. The sky seemed to spiral over Paul's head as he clung obstinately to the ball while the raccoons pulled him into his own team's bench area. The next thing Paul knew, he was being slammed into the team table. Gatorade spilled, towels flew, clipboards scattered. Somewhere a whistle blew and the referees were suddenly yelling. Paul was aware of heavy weights down lifting from his body. The tacklers, having brought down their prey, were reluctant to leave it. Dazed, Paul just laid there for a moment, staring up. And then, like an angel peering over the edge of a heavenly cloud, Meg Penny stared down at him with a horrified expression. Say, Meg, said Paul, trying a wobbly smile, do you have any plans this evening? From his perch atop his rebuilt 1958 Indian motorcycle, Brian Flagg stared glumly at the scene around him. How the hell did I ever end up in a dump like this, he wondered. Morgan City, USA. He listened for a moment to the distant cheers rising from the high school football field. Then he leaned over and pulled the cold cores from the Morgan High book bag. Popped it, sipped it. Ah, cold and clear. Hell of a lot better than the piss that Morgan City produced. Mountain Chill Beer. Flag hated Mountain Chill Beer. Mountain Chill Beer was what had brought him here to Morgan City. Brought his old man, anyway. And along with the old man in need of work came Mom and little baby Brian. But that was a long time ago. The old man had left. Mom had stayed, however, to take care of her son, eking out a tenuous seasonal existence just as Morgan City, USA did. Morgan City was a small community formed in the misty past before the Great Depression around some reasonably decent ski slopes. Unfortunately, the initial investors ended up as Wall Street casualties in 1929, and Morgan City ski slopes never quite recovered, never gained their recognition and pizzazz or classiness of a vale or a sun valley. Part of its economic recovery hopes clung to the location of a new brewery and the surge of growth after World War II. But now, after the 19th, 1970s, with the giant breweries such as Anheuser-Busch either swallowing or putting the independents out of business, Mountain Chill Brewery of Colorado was a dwindling proposition. 
What they need to try, Brian Flagg reflected as he took a pull of his cores, is to learn how to make some good brew. That would be a start, anyway. It was really a pretty amazing town, when you thought about it. Brian mused. It was as if it were frozen in the 50s, like the whole football business, pure 50s. The buildings had all the square, boxy look of the 50s, and the people, well, they were just as square and boxy. The place even had an old-timer diner and an old-time movie theater. Maybe what Morgan City should become, thought Brian Flagg, is a life-size museum. A tourist haven for all those children of the 70s who were nostalgic for their parents' own youth. He looked down at his clothes and his bike and smiled grimly to himself. Yeah, and I'd be the hoodie teenager who loses it in the end. The fact that Flagg was a teenager was something he tried hard to hide. You had to look past that quiet, adult, dark intensity. You need to peer through the shades that always hide his eyes. Only then might you guess that he was actually a hair short of 18. His outfit surely offered no clues to his age. Certainly not the two-tone 40s thrift jacket over the white t-shirt and not the worn blue jeans, the crepe-soled rockabilly shoes and the tiny metal stud in one ear. No, these things made Brian Flagg look as if he'd been through a lot more living than one can experience in 18 years, which, of course, was just the effect he wanted. He wondered idly now if all that cheering back at his alma mater meant that the Hawks had scored a touchdown. Not that he cared much. That was behind him. Now, mostly what he was concerned about was why what lay before him, this riverbed. If he was going to try and jump the mother. It was dry now, more like a ravine than a riverbed. When it actually had been a river, there also had been a bridge. But all that remained of the bridge now was a short section of rotted timber extending into midair. Flag started the motorcycle and maneuvered to the edge of the gully, one hand still holding the beer. He drove in a lazy loop for a moment or two, contemplating the bridge. Then he drove halfway up the thing, stopped, and kicked the wooden supports with his foot. Yeah, he thought, this should do. The timber should make an okay ramp. A quick dart up the ramp, then over, that 30 feet to the other side? Sure, no sweat. Decided finally, he drove the motorbike back the 50 yards or so he needed to get a good takeoff. As he listened to the revving sounds of the engine and steeled himself for the jump, he noticed peripherally a figure emerge from the woods nearby, followed closely by another smaller figure. He turned to check them out, and then laughed to himself. <laughs> Shit, just the can man and his mangy mutt. The scruffy old dude, the can man, was a codger who looked as if he'd fallen off the rails in the 30s and decided to stick around. He lived in an old shack up a ways and made his living collecting bottles and cans and whatnot, which he turned in for nickels and dimes. The can man was a figure of popular local mythology, wearing all sorts of identities to the minds of youngsters growing up in Morgan City. Brian's own mother had warned him to stay away from the guy, but when he was only nine, Flagg had actually ventured to the shack one day, where he'd quickly ascertained that the can man was just a harmless fellow who didn't leave much to say. Certainly he wasn't any kind of boogeyman. In fact, Flagg rather identified with him. He was an outcast, too. Their bond ended there, however. The can man had little to do with anyone or anything, except the business of being a hermit and collecting stuff to sell. Brian understood. In fact, he respected that. But his dog, now, there's another matter. That scruffy mutt had already tried to bite him a couple times, so Brian gave the creature a wide berth. Now they were his audience. So, fine, he'd show the can man and his dog how to jump a gully. Flag took another swallow of beer, then crumpled the half-empty can and threw it toward the can man. There you go, guy, he snarled, for your collection. The dog barked, and Brian Flag chuckled. He could still hear the cheering from Morgan City High, and he pretended that they were yelling for him. Yeah, here's Brian Flag, Colorado's answer to Evil Knievel, about to show his stuff to the world. What? A 25-foot jump? With a machine like this one under his butt? <laughs> Why, it would be child's play. Yo! he called. Here goes! He gunned the throttle of the Indian, jammed the bike into gear, and spun out, spraying dirt behind him. The engine roared loud and hard, and the thrill of acceleration added excitement to Flagg's determination. The wind whipped through his hair, whistling louder and louder as he went faster and faster. He bent his head forward to decrease the drag and yanked the throttle down all the way. The field flashed by. The bridge approached. Man, oh man, this was going to be a rush. He was really going to do it. But then the Indian coughed. It sputtered and it coughed again, just yards from the bridge ramp. 
Flag gunned it again. What the hell was... Damn, he wasn't going to have the speed to make the jump. Instantly, he jammed on the brakes, but it was too late. The bike skidded, kicked up dust as it veered to one side. Desperately, he dug his heel into the ground, fighting his momentum as he reached the lip of the gully. For an endless moment, he hung, teetering as the very edge of the busted bridge. Brian desperately shifted his weight, lurching back away from the precipice. His muscles strained as the machine tottered beneath him. And then the bike dropped, dragging him along with it. It really wasn't too deep a fall till he hit the side of the gully, maybe five or six feet, and Flag managed to land without the bike falling on his head. But the jolt was too strong and the pull of gravity too great. Both he and the Indian tumbled and slid ass over elbows, handlebars over axles, to the bottom of the gulch, collecting a goodly amount of dirt and dents along the way. For Flag, the world twirled around, away, and then with an abrupt lurch and a splash, he found himself at the bottom, lying in a thick trickle of water. The motorbike on top, pinning him into the muddy clay. Wetness spread through his trousers, sopping him, and he struggled to get up. You not only let me down, he said to the Indian, you rub my nose in it. What kind of faithful companion are you? The cheers from the high school football game seemed to mock him. Then closer applause came from above. Flag looked up. The can man was peering over the edge above, a big grin on his stubbly face. He started to wheeze with laughter. Flag shot him a glare, then began to wiggle out from beneath the bike. The can man chuckled a little more as he polished Flag's discarded Coors can and chucked it in with the clank into his plastic sack. The mutt whimpered away. Flag sighed and finally pulled himself free. The can man turned and followed his dog. Flag shook his head morosely. God, the humiliation. He couldn't have suffered this failure alone. He had to have Jimmy Nick and the can man witness it. Like that saying, if a tree falls in the forest with no one to hear it, does it really make a sound? If Brian Flagg gets chuckled into the mud by his bike, does he feel embarrassed unless someone sees it? Well, he felt damned embarrassed. Maybe that meant he was just proving something, that through hell, if he knew what it was, uh, wasn't as if the old can man was going to go and blab his story all over town. The can man didn't say diddly to most people, and he didn't exactly hang out with the boys on the general store porch, so why did it bother him? Flag knew why. The can man didn't use his mouth much, but sure as hell, he used his ears. He knew Brian Flagg, and sure as shit, he knew the boy's troubled history. Trouble, trouble, trouble was the theme here, with no happy endings, just a couple of stretches in Juvie Hall getting reformed. The old can man was probably thinking, typical, typical Flag move trouble. He thinks he's so cool, and he ends up wallowing in a ditch. Brian stood and brushed his pants off. He pulled the bike up and pushed it toward a dry area so it wouldn't get messed up worse. He loved his bike. It was cheap transportation, cheap freedom, and Brian Flagg cherished freedom deeply. Now, more than ever since he'd been deprived of it a few times, he just had to work out the kinks. That was all. He'd get it running right again. He was a pretty good mechanic, used to his machine. Still, as he parked the bike, the memory of the can man's derisive clapping and the cheering in the distance lingered in his mind. A low heat of anger simmered deep as he knocked some of the mud off the bike. People could be real jerks, all right. They peg you for something, and then that's what they stick you with. He remembered when he was a kid, he'd hear the whispers behind his back. Hey, that's Josh Flagg's boy, isn't it? Like father, like son. Blood will out. Following in daddy's footsteps. God, that had hurt. All his memories of Joshua Flagg had been good ones, at least up until Joshua Flagg had embezzled that money and skipped town, abandoning son and wife. That was a pain that Flagg didn't think much about, but, of course, it never really went away. And even since Dad ran off, the whole town had been waiting for him to turn bad, too. All Brian had ever wanted was to, for somebody to know that he was different. He made a few mistakes, sure, and the way he acted, the way he dressed, yeah, maybe it wasn't exactly in the regular social mode of Morgan City, USA, but it was him. It was Brian Flagg, and to hell with them if they couldn't take a joke, right? Damned right. He'd show them all. Soon as he could get some money together, get some prospects someplace else, he'd be out of here, leave the stupid little town, dumb old Morgan City with its cheesy ski resort and its watery, gassy beer. He tried to start the bike, but it didn't even sputter. Yeah, he'd be out of here all right. But now, on to his bike. He'd have to get the bike fixed, and working right before he could even think about such a thing, he'd have to get the tools. 
Reluctantly, Brian left the bike and began to walk to town. Morgan City, USA. It wasn't a name that carried a lot of magic. Not like Hollywood, or Miami, or New York. An occasional tourist at the Indian Summit Resort might ask, Named after J. Pierpont Morgan, right? The multimillionaire? Maybe he started the place, yeah? The residents, upon hearing such a question, would just smile knowingly and neither nod nor shake their heads. The truth, which they seldom shared, was that Morgan was the name of the trapper who had built a shack there over a hundred years ago and had ended up ignoramously scalped and butchered by the local Indians. Morgan Lodge, a headquarters for hunters, had become Morgan Resort in the early 20s. The town that grew up to house the people who worked at Morgan Resort became Morgan City. But in truth, it remained a town, marooned in the middle of the country, clinging desperately to the past with a vague hope for the future, but mostly just happy to eke out a present. Morgan City had all the prerequisites of a classic American town. There was a weather-beaten post office, a pseudo-colonial town hall, an American Legion building that desperately needed a paint job, a pseudo-Gothic high school, and a ticky-tacky box of an elementary school. And, of course, there were clusters of suburban houses strewn around, each built in whatever cheap style predominated in the decade of their creation. But the single enduring symbol of an earlier innocence, of a period of hope and prosperity, as well as the cornerstone of its social life, to say nothing of its gustatory tradition, was the town diner. The Tick Tock Diner was built in the late 40s in the classic roadside Pullman design, as though poised and ready to be hitched up to some train and make a streamlined exit at any moment. It was the 50s, however, that had left its stamp on the place when Tandy Rumpyard had bought it and called it Tick Tock after the garish neon clock sign he purchased in Denver at a bankruptcy sale. Even today, Elvis songs still play on the jukebox and echoed against the dinner's metal walls. The whole place smelled of years' worth of malteds and cheeseburgers. A cemetery of cracked linoleum and dulled metal, the Tick Tock might have been a monument to nostalgic memories of better days if the owner had cared to polish it up a bit, take out the patched orange booth seats and remortar some of the tile. But why should he? Morgan City was just too busy, just hanging on to care much about nostalgia. It was too busy using the TikTok Diner as a place to eat and meet, to think in terms of its history and style. And they all did use it, from the oldest resident to the youngest, each agreeing you could say what you wanted about the grease and the pall, but the TikTok still managed to brew the best coffee in town. Sheriff Herb Geller certainly thought so. It was his kind of coffee, all right, not that battery acid stuff at the local McDonald's. This coffee was thick and rich, dark and deep, with a smooth taste and a no afterbite. And they served it with real cream, too. Well, half and half, close enough. The sheriff half turned on the creaky old metal stool that sat at part of the row in front of the counter. He looked into the afternoon light, and then he looked back at his coffee in its chipped cup, and then he looked over to where Fran Hewitt sat, dreamily watching the convection heat rise from the macadam parking lot. The sheriff was dying to make some conversation with the lady, and coffee, he supposed, was about as good as any subject to start. Coffee's even better than usual, said Sheriff Geller, easing his girth a little closer to the counter. Fran looked over at him, her eyebrows raised. She didn't seem at all annoyed, but he'd interrupted her daydreaming. Pardon me, Herb? I said I'd like this coffee any day over that battery acid they dredge up over at McDonald's. Yeah, it ain't bad, is it? Fran was a handsome lady, in her thirties, with a kind of resignation hanging on her that signified she'd been waiting on tables all her life so far, and expected to be waiting on tables the rest of her years. Still, she kept herself looking good, and had a touch of sass to her that Herb found appealing. You want some more? she asked. Sure do. She poured him some more coffee, and the steam and rich, nutty flavor rose up in the hot breath from the stained ceramic cup. You're an obstinate fella, Herb. Everybody else who comes in here is sucking up the iced tea or on a scorcher like today, and you're sticking to your coffee. He was about to respond to that when a pair of telephone linemen barged through into the diner and plopped into a booth. Pardon me, Herb. Ma Bell rings, said Fran, pulling a couple of menus from a rack and going around to serve the men. 
Herb took a stainless steel metal creamer from its spot by the salt and pepper and poured himself some into the coffee. Steam rose and clouds swirled in the liquid as he looked at the coffee. Hell, he thought, why am I drinking hot coffee on a day like this? Fran came back and he immediately waved at her. You know, I'm one stubborn son of a bitch. You're right. Give me an iced tea, Fran. She smiled, filled a glass with ice and poured. Good, I suppose you're... You've guessed that the manager's given me a healthy commission on iced tea today. Keller laughed as he took the iced tea. He drank some, no sugar, and he said, Yeah, Fran, hits the spot. It was that kind of day. He was about to start up another conversation, broaching a subject he'd been working up for half an hour now, when the lineman started waving for Fran's attention. Herb Geller had been sheriff of Morgan City for over ten years now. Before that, he'd been a police officer in Denver, accepting a job as a cop in the small town when he got sick of dealing with big city stuff and just wanted to get away. When Sheriff Patterson had thrown in the towel and retired, Herb Geller had been in the exact right spot to run for sheriff. He liked the job. He really did. It wasn't just that he liked being a big fish in a little pond. He had honestly grown to care about this town and its people, to sympathize with their problems. They were people just like people everywhere, and the fact that they had to hang on to just a little harder than most to keep their town alive appealed to Geller. Trouble was, here he sat, a good three years past the big 4-0, and his wife Abby was long gone. She said she couldn't stand it here, that she missed Denver, so she moved back and got hitched up to some other cop. And now Herb Geller was sitting tired of just dating the pretty snow bunnies that showed up for winter vacations. Now he was looking around for someone steady. And then just last year, Fran Hewitt showed up. She was with some guy at the time, but now he was gone. Herbert started noticing her right away. But at first, Fran had seemed about as friendly as a rattlesnake. She wouldn't go out with nobody. But lately, she was getting friendlier, smiling at him and talking. Then it was his turn to get nervous and tongue-tied. It was one thing to chase ladies who were eager for a holiday romance, ladies you probably would never see again. It was a different thing entirely with a woman you saw every day, who knew all your warts and ticks and probably your history as well. So now he was really thinking hard about putting it out on the line, thinking about finally asking few Fran Hewitt out. He drained half the cold glass, thinking about what to say. As Fran stepped behind the counter and slapped the order onto the ledge of the window between the serving area and the kitchen, Geller groped in his mind for another conversation starter. That's the biggest order of the whole hour I've been here, he said. Looks like the games put you out of business. She looked at him strangely, then realized he was just making conversation. Don't worry, when they're done screaming their heads off, they'll be coming in here like a flood. More iced tea? Herb pushed his glass forward. Please. Fran had long hair that was drawn tightly behind her head now, making her look severe. But those bluish eyes and those soft lips betrayed a kind of vulnerability that appealed immensely to Herb Geller. That made him really want to know about this lady. As she poured him the tea, he noticed admiringly the way she kept her uniform starched and clean. He caught a whiff of fresh scrub skin, a hint of opium perfume, which just happened to be his very favorite. Good to see this town gotten up on its hind legs about something, she said, even if it is only just a football game. Takes their minds off their troubles. Been a lean year for most folks. Fran shrugged. Ski season's almost here. They'll be tourists. I hear you like the tourists, especially Herb. Before he could comment, she grabbed his plate, which held the remnants of his tuna and whole wheat. You done with this? Yeah. Cripes, he thought. So she'd heard about him and the ski ladies. That figured. This wasn't a big town, and it was only to be expected that the sheriff's sexual activity is would get talked about. Still, her comment did put a bit of a crimp in his confidence. He had been planning on playing himself as a shy and lonely guy, both of which he really and truly was down deep. But with his reputation, it sure didn't look like it. The truth was he didn't really mind much getting rejected by ladies he didn't especially care about. Experience showed that about one in seven would say yes anyway. But when you did care... Nah, the hell with it, he thought. Get on with it, Geller. You know, Fran, he said, they got a new band out at the Tin Palace tonight. The Spurs. Country and Western, so they say. Is that right? Fran turned, but her expression stayed blank. Supposed to be pretty good. That's nice. You like country music? 
Herb continued, not knowing what else to say. Then she seemed to get it. She leveled her gaze at him, really looking at him for the first time all day. Herb, are you asking me out? Herb stammered for a moment. Well, uh, uh, well, yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> Suddenly it was Fran's turn to be flustered, and Herb Geller couldn't tell why. He had a bad feeling, though, as she scribbled out his check, her back towards him. I don't know, she said suddenly. I'm stuck here pretty late. Gotta make a living, you know. Uh-oh, here comes the excuses. Herb knew a gentle letdown when he heard it, and he didn't have to hear any more. Feelings sinking a bit, he tried to bow out gracefully. Yeah, it must be pretty tough to get away. Suddenly a commotion sounded from outside. Both Herb and Fran shifted their gaze to the street, viewed through the diner's window. What they saw was a horde of high school students streaming banners and making noise descending upon the diner. We won, was the cry. We beat him, Fran, yelped a girl in glasses. She flung open the door and entered, bringing in the noise inside with her. We won 21 to 14. Oh, shit, said Fran. She turned, bent down, and hollered into the kitchen. George, here they come. The teenagers poured in, sweaty and wide-eyed, whooping and waving, turning the whole diner into instant chaos. Herb shook his head at the sight. He pulled out his wallet to pay, took out one of his cards, and handed it to Fran along with a $5 bill. If you ever get a little time to yourself, there's my number down at the station, he said. Oh, and uh, keep the change. Hardly acknowledging this, Fran just grabbed the money and the card, stuffing both into her pocket. She went off to deal with the babbling teenagers at the counter. Okay, one at a time, she yelled. Bemused, Herb looked down at the receipt he had hand, she had handed him. Below the addition, words were jotted. I'm off at 11 o'clock, they read. A rush of relief and happiness flooded Herb Geller. Not a rejection after all. He had a date. A real, genuine, maybe this might lead to something date. He stuffed the check behind his ticket book, squared his shoulders, straightened his gun and holster, and sauntered off to his cruiser, feeling proud and happy. The teenagers just ignored him. The old pickup truck grumbled and squeaked to a halt right next to the TikTok diner. Brian Flagg jumped out of the back, slapping the battered blue side of the cab. Thanks for the ride, he said to the man in the baseball cap behind the wheel. No problem, fellas, stay good. Brian winked, and the pickup truck roared away, leaving behind a rooster tail of dust. Gotta see Moss Wolseley, thought Brian. He'll help me out. I gotta get my bike fixed before dark, and Moss is my only hope. Brian Flagg started up the road toward Moss's place, past the TikTok. Too bad he didn't have time for a Coke or something. He could use one. Still, with that horde of his classmates inside there, the TikTok scene was not exactly one that he cared to make today. Just then, Sheriff Geller walked out of the diner, easily the last man that Brian Flagg wanted to see right now. Or forever, for that matter. Luckily, Geller didn't seem to notice him, but just slid into his bubble top and gunned the engine. Flagg picked up a little speed, skipped over to the sidewalk, and faded into the shadows of a hardware store's awning. He turned his back, pretending to admire the hammers and chisels on display in the front window. Sheriff Geller was the guy who'd put Flagg on ice twice, and he was not the sort that Brian Flagg cared to make idle chit-chat with. The black-and-white Lincoln eased along the road behind him, and Flagg could almost sense it stopping. Oh, shit. Flagg? Congratulations! cried that too familiar voice. Brian Flagg turned. Congratulations for what? he asked in a surly tone. Here you got a birthday coming up. No more juvie hall. Right? You got that right, Sheriff, Brian said. You bet, said the Sheriff, stabbing a finger at him. Next time you fuck up, you're in the majors. Herb Geller grinned. See you around, Flag. The bubble top cruised on. Flag sighed. Geller would like that. Geller was the guy who'd pegged him early as a juvie and had made damn sure that Brian Flagg didn't get an inch to spare. That was why, when Brian Flagg had been caught at something even slightly unlawful, in this case fooling around in the brewery with some guys, guzzling some free beer in the middle of the night, the proverbial book had been thrown at him. And it was at the Websterville Juvenile Detention Hall for four long weekends of reform that he had met the guys that gotten him into trouble the second time. 
Vinnie Marshall and Ted Klinko once sprung themselves. They'd bring their motorbikes over to Bryan in Morgan City for minor repairs. Bryan had pulled around with them for a while, attracting Sheriff Geller's attention. Then when Vinny and Ted were seen hauling loot through the broken door of someone's apartment, the sheriff immediately showed up at Brian Flagg's house with a search warrant. Unfortunately for Brian, the guys had stashed a few stolen articles in the shed in his backyard. Equally unfortunate, the shed was the place where he kept a small bag of marijuana as well. They never caught Marshall and Klinko, at least not around these parts, but they did put Brian back in Juvie Hall for his summer vacation. It wasn't like he didn't expect it, though. Maintaining his hard veneer, Flagg had always cultivated the rougher crowd. If you've ever had been a gang in Morgan City, Flagg had belonged to it. That it had been a play gang consisting only of a bunch of kids who liked to pretend to be tough meant nothing to the local authorities. Brian Flagg looked like a hood, therefore he was a hood, and like any potential troublemaker, he could be swashed. The earlier the better. Flagg knew he shouldn't complain too much. He had played the role, and at least it gave him an identity, when he liked a hell of a lot more than those white bread sorts who were the general run of Morgan City youth. And it wasn't like he didn't have friends here. He thought he headed towards a sign labeled Moss's Repair Shop. There were some folks around who liked him. Moss Woolsey was a friend, and Brian knew he could count on Moss helping him get his wheels back on the road. Flag sauntered across the street and went into the grimy cinder block garage. Ah, the smell of old tires and oil, of gasoline and elbow grease. Flagg smiled at the familiar aroma. It was this garage that, with the help of Moss, he had fine-tuned his mechanic skills. It was there that he had learned the heavy-duty, by-the-seat-of-your-pants mechanical stuff, like how to strip an old engine, clean it, put it back together with second-hand parts, and then stick it into a car shell it wasn't designed for. As soon as he reached the legal age, Flagg fully intended to get into serious drag car stuff. Right now, though, a motorcycle would have to do. As he strode in, Flagg saw Moss bent over, wrenching away at the engine of a large snowcat. On the cat's door was the logo, Indian Summit Ski Resort. Yo, Moss, said Flagg. K possible, buddy. I see you fooled the resort people again. Make them think you can fix this thing. Way to go. The muscular, middle-aged black man lifted his head and peered at Flagg. A thick, soggy cigar protruded from his mouth. Yeah, that's a ritual, ain't it? Moss said, surveying his visitor and reacting with a flinch. Phew, you look like hell, man. Flagg looked down at himself. He was dusty, disheveled, and still wet. He ran a hand through his usually well-cared-for hair and found that it was a mess as well. He struck a pose and said, Hey, it's a fashion statement. Moss grunted. Mm-hmm. The only statement them clues got to make is I look like hell. Flagg didn't want to bother his friend while he was busy, so he made his pitch immediately. So, Moss, my bike's sitting out at Elkins Grove. Can I borrow your ratchet set? Moss took the cigar from his mouth. When Moss took the cigar from his mouth, that many had something important to say. You kidding me? The summit's got me overhauling six fucking skidoos, three snowcats, and two flatbed snowmakers by Monday. Flag shook his head and looked back out at the bright sunlight. What's the hurry? Must be 90 degrees out. Moss chuckled. Apparently deciding it was time for a break, he strode over to one of the flatbed snowmakers he alluded to. There was a six-pack sticking out of a pile of man-made snow on the lip of the thing, and Moss took one of the bottles and tossed it to Flag. He took another for himself, opened it, and took a pull. Just Indian summer out there, boy. Another pull, a shake of his cigar, out toward the mountains. Before you know it, winter will come tear-assing through this town with no apologies. Fall ain't nothing but a rumor around these parts. Using the edge of a steel locker, Flag knocked the cap off his beer bottle. Come on, barely pissed snow the last couple of years. This whole town's ready to fold. Moss looked troubled by that remark. This year's going to be different. Is that right? Take my word, you're going to wish your piece of shit excuse for a motorcycle was one of these sweet little rigs. He patted the side of one of the snowcats. It wasn't a brand new snowcat by any means, but it had been kept polished its big front skin looked good, and its fuselage was shiny and ready. I'll put on chains, said Flag. What about the ratchet, Moss? Moss shook his head and went back to work on the engine. Flag had been afraid of this. He and Moss were still pals, but it was true that it was Flag who was always asking for favors. 
and there was no question that Moss had not forgotten the joyride Brian took last month in a Porsche that Moss had been fixing in his shop, a ride taken totally without permission. The car came back with no dents, but Moss had been furious. What if the sheriff had caught you, man? He had yelled. My ass would have been in the same crack as yours. There's a $35,000 piece of machinery there, Brian. I could have gotten into a shitload of trouble with the owner if you even scratched that thing. Flag didn't blame Moss for be being angry, but he really needed those ratchets now. The bike's motor just needed some adjustments, some tightening, that's all. It was an old thing that Flag and Moss had put together themselves, and you couldn't blame it if it conked out once in a while. Still, Flag owed his friend. Maybe he could offer a recompense. All right, maybe if I put in some hours for you over the weekend, he said, maybe that would lighten things up. Moss sighed. There's 12 ratchets in that set. 12. And they better all be there when I get it back, too. Flag grinned. He went over to the tool bench to where he knew the ratchet set was, gathered it up, rolling it into his cloth sleeve, and sticking it into his jacket pocket. Thanks, Moss, he said. I owe you one. Mm-hmm. Moss grunted. You owe me too damn many. Flag said goodbye and strode out, eager to fix his bike and wrap his legs around freedom once again. In the mountains, the light at dusk has a curious, otherworldly quality. It seems to bend around the slopes, filling valleys with soft shadows. It is a beautiful time of day, and tonight the sunset was especially beautiful. The can man, however, didn't give a damn about sunsets. Not tonight or any night. He was too busy. He had his job to attend to, and a working man didn't have time to stare at the mountains and watch the sun go down. It had been a good haul today, the can man thought as he picked through the batch in his canvas sack. There was a Budweiser can, a Miller draft can, and a Coors can. In fact, the very one that Punk Kid had tossed before he made the Kamikaze motorcycle run into the gully. What was that guy's name? The can man wondered as he sorted the various brands. Oh, yeah, Flag. Brian Flag. <laughs> Guy that came poking around all the time when he was younger, trying to make conversation. Probably trying to learn the can trade, trying to dip into the can man's business. Well, the punk wouldn't steal any of his tricks of trade, not from Jimmy Nick, the can man. Tricks like the one he was about to perform. The can man lifted his cracked work boot. Strapped to the bottom of the boot was the ancient rusty iron skillet. The can man had imported from a junkyard in Denver when he came out here. In the waning twilight, he studiously inspected the arrangement of the cans, making sure they were lined up so. He aimed, then pushed down hard. Vroom! Metal against metal, the skillet mashed down on the perfectly arranged cans, flattening them. The can man moved his foot and checked his handiwork. Yep, just right. Now, on the old low stump, instead of three cans, there were three flat circles. They were easier to carry this way, and the boys down at the recycler center liked them that way. They liked them so much, in fact, that they gave the can man an extra quarter a pound. Now, his skillet secret was one he wouldn't share with anyone. After all, there were only so many cans to go around in Morgan City, and the can man had dibs on them all. He chuckled as he stared at the flattened cans. <laughs> Couldn't, he said. Then he looked over at Nixon, his dog. You gotta do it right, Tricky Dicky, or they won't pay you that extra quarter. Nixon looked him with his sad eyes. Then he yawned and scratched. Huh, Dicky? Don't pack. Don't be talking back to me like that. I fed you some good ground groundhogs today. Your favorite. So don't sass the old can man. He picked up the three circles of aluminum and tossed them into a large wire basket near the ramshackle porch of his shack. Then he picked out three more from his sack and situated them on the stump in preparation for his skillet maneuver. Let's talk philosophy this evening, boy. You tell me, Nixon, how many angels can dance on the head of a beer can? Voomph! Three more flattened cans. He was developing into a regular machine. In the 25 years since he'd first appeared in Morgan City, Jimmy Nick, a.k.a. the Can Man, had become something of a local institution, and in all those years he hadn't really changed. Today, just as then, he was a grizzled old codger with gray hair, a stubbly beard on a wrinkled face atop a wiry frame. The truth also was that only rights he had to, had to this land and his shack were squatter's rights, so no one bothered him. However, he was harmless, and besides... He took care of Morgan City's litter problem. 
Take a special aptitude doing what we do. Having your own business, the can man told Nixon as he threw more flattened cans into their storage bin. Like I always tell you, boy, our motto is, can do! The can man was putting out the next three cans to be flattened when it happened. The first hint that something was up from Nixon, the dog let out an odd sort of whiny growl, then jumped up suddenly, his hair sticking up on end. Startled, the can man knocked over one of the cans. He turned to look over at Nixon, who was now growling at the sky. Following the dog's gaze, he looked up into the twilight, but couldn't see anything. Then he realized it was the sound that Nixon was reacting to, the sound of a low whine that was rapidly rising higher and higher in pitch, and it was getting louder, too. He turned to the west, toward the sound, and then he saw the light, a soft glow when it first noticed, but, but getting brighter and brighter, and the whine kept growing, too, turning into a roar. Cripes! It's a flaming chariot, thought the can man, coming down to get him. The roar grew deafening as the fireball hurled closer. The can man fell to the ground, covering his face and his ears, and the fiery thing raced by like an ignited freight train. And then it landed, exploding in one huge, scorching blast. Even from a distance, the can man could feel the heat flowing over him like a river. When the noise subsided, he became aware again of Nixon barking crazily. Then a dog tore off toward the woods where the thing had crashed. Holy shit, I've got to see what this thing is, thought the can man, stumbling as he got up, at first forgetting about the skillet tied to his foot. He wobbled about, his heart hammering in his chest, finally getting the thing off and then running after the dog, taking time only to grab the hand axe leaning against the shed, just in case. There was no problem in finding the thing. It had burned a path straight through the tops of the trees. Thank God it had been raining this week, some thought the can man, or the whole forest would burn up in a snap. Instead, the flames were just dancing on the top of the trees, flickering out. The can man followed the trail of destruction, noting how some trees had been snapped in half. He could still hear Nixon barking up ahead. Wait up, wait up, you mangy mutt, he cried, stumbling through the thick growth. Suddenly he stopped, startled by what he saw ahead of him. A crater! The thing burning down from the sky had smacked into the forest with such force that it made a huge hole, splashing earth aside as if it were mud. Nixon was barking away at the edge of the crater, but he didn't go out down into it. The can man eased his way closer and stroked the dog comfortingly. Hey, pal, what do we got here then, eh? The can man peered up over the edge, a bright light bathing his battered features, filling the darkening air with an eerie glow. Woo-wee, he said, staring down into the crater. Blue and green flames danced along the crater's rim, but they were slowly dying out as brackish smoke funneled up into the night sky. The fumes had the smell of burnt sulfur mixed with charred wood and scorched earth. It made the can man's eyes tear up. He watched a while, waiting for the flames to flicker down. Then he picked up his axe handle and, brandishing it before him, approached closer. You stay here, Nixon, he ordered. No telling what this is, but I suspect it's one of them there meteorites, and near as I recall, meteorites, oh, they're made from metal. Who knows, we might have ourselves a fortune here. Maybe we can buy ourselves a can factory, the dog growled. Okay, okay, a canned dog food factory, how's that? Through diminishing haze, he could make out a charred red sphere protruding from the earth. A sphere with a crack down the middle. Maybe we got us some goodies inside, Nixon. Now, now stay back, boy. Stay. I'm going to check this out, baby. The heat remained fierce, but moment by moment it slacked off. The can man was impatient. He wanted to see if this was indeed going to be the big find of his life. He stepped down farther feet crunching the burnt earth. He squinted down at the object through watery eyes. Then he saw it. Inside the sphere, something pulsed. It was more than light, more than flames. It was the shimmering of something fluid, like the glimmer of a reflection at the bottom of a well. It stirred and turned, undulating, slithering. A soft hissing sound filled the air. Nixon, too, was transfixed, his bark silenced. With a faint whimper, he scurried away, spooked. 
Good idea, pal, said the can man. But me, I'm the curious type. Gotta see what this is. What you think? Molten gold? Platinum? Worth lots more than aluminum, I should think. To one side of the crater, there was a fallen branch stripped of its leaves. The can man picked it up and began to poke at the thing below him. He aimed the end of the stick into the glowing, cracked hulk on the bottom of the crater. He stuck it in as far as he could safely reach, to where a kind of volcanic soup boiled within the object. The stick slid into the fluid. What he sensed at the end of this probe was a thick, curiously viscous substance, like tapioca pudding when it's still hot. Didn't look like much to be metal, thought the canned man. Wonder what the hell it is. There was a tug on the stick. It was a gentle tug, like the nibble of a trout at the end of a fishing line, but it was a definite tug, nonetheless. Creepy, thought the canned man. Well, he could let this thing cool a while, then check it out. He had a weird feeling here, and maybe it would be wise to just leave well enough alone for the time being. He'd come back later to check this number out. He pulled the stick from the smoking object. There was something on the end of the stick, he noticed immediately. Something that looked grossly like a giant glob of phlegm, a mass about the size of his fist. Its transparent surface steamed and sparkled in the glow from the object and from the traces of fire that still flickered on the periphery of the crater. The can man tilted the stick more, giving it a little shake. The funny-looking stuff didn't fall off. Instead, it clung, as if it was glued on or something. Well, I'll be, said the can man. This is the damnedest thing. Nixon, come here and have a gander at this boy. He stepped back at the side of the crater, waving the stick back and forth with greater force. Then he checked the wad again. It was still there. It seemed to flex now, drawing into itself. Hey, what a discovery, thought the old man, stepping back. Fascinating. He stared in wonder at the complexities of this globule at the end of the stick. It seemed to sparkle with a kind of iridescence that dazzled the old man's eyes. For a moment he stood transfixed. Incredibly quickly, the stuff streamed up along the stick. Like a cobra striking it, it hit the old man's hand, folding about like a sheep. The old man screamed, but there was no one to hear him. He let go of the stick, but it was too late. The blob of stuff was now attached to him, fully wrapped around his hand, all the way up to the wrist. The can man stared down at the thing in horror. His hand started to tingle, to itch, and then it felt as if it were on fire.